reach through the darkness, shine across the earth, send the shadows to fly. Light up the world from the beginning, the tragedies of time. Nothing compares to this 
powerful. You're Jehovah, Emmanuel, God with us. God, you came to be with us. Not just that we, so that we would know you, but that we could be with you, that we could learn to live like you, that we could become like you. We thank you. We thank you, Jesus, today. You alone are worthy. In Jesus' name, amen. 
Amen. Before you're seated, friends, let's pass the peace of Christ. Meet some new friends around you. So glad to have you with us today. Good morning again, everyone. This is the second Sunday of Advent. And so Darby and Kyle Pohl are up here to uh, do our reading and light the candle. And their little baby Hollis is up in the nursery. But um, So let's welcome them as they uh, do our reading for us this morning. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel, for he he has shown shown favor and and redeemed redeemed his his people. people. He has raised up a savior in the house of his servant David, as spoken spoken on the lips of his holy prophets of old. He has shown mercy to us and remembered his holy covenant. We will serve him in holiness and righteousness all the days of our lives. The tender mercy of God will dawn on high and visit us with salvation. It will shine on those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death. Christ is coming to guide our feet in the way of peace. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. Thanks, y'all. And at the close of our service, we do take up an offering. So if you want to leave a gift in the baskets where we came in, you can do so. Or go on your phone uh, or on the details you see on the screen. If you're with us at home worshiping and want to participate this way, we greatly appreciate that. So thank you all for your your gifts. Um, And uh, there's lots of ways you can give in the holiday season that you'll see in your announcement page. So please check that out. Uh, Please take them before you leave. So we're in the second week of our Advent series, Voices of Hope, Prophecies of the Coming King. And today we're going to see Malachi. We'll read Malachi chapter 3. And in Malachi, you see this theme of um, sacrifices to God, offerings to God that are just not satisfactory. And God is upset with the people of Judah, and particularly the priests. And it got me thinking, what's the most valuable thing uh, I've ever seen in my life in terms of like money. Now we all see valuable stuff, a lot of our homes worth a lot of money, your car, uh, lots of things. But for me, the first thing that popped in my mind was I was at a sleepover with a friend in the 1980s, which is weird because I'm, I'm only 25 years old. And, 
And I was at a friend's house, and at one point in the night, he said, you want to, go, you want to see my dad's baseball card collection? And I collected baseball cards at the time and comic books, and I said, sure, that'd be great, yeah. So we went into the special room, and the dad pulled down this box, and he proceeded to show me the greatest baseball card collection I've ever seen. He had the entire 1952 Topps run, every card. And for the uninitiated person, that was Mickey Mantle's rookie year, New York Yankees. So uh, that guy had a lot of valuable baseball cards and big pieces of acrylic and, you know, real safe. And he had two Mickey Mantle rookie cards. Two! Now, for the uninitiated, I didn't know this. I looked it up this week. One of those in mint condition two years ago, go, guess how much it sold for? $12.7 million for a piece of paper and some ink. $12 million. So he had two Mickey Mantle rookie cards. One was pristine, and it was in a big block of acrylic. And I was just like, I couldn't. He, he, and of course, he wouldn't even let us touch it, which is fine, because I was 10 years old or something. And then he had another one that it was Mickey Mantle, but it was kind of, you know, it was, it was messed up. The, the corners were kind of bad, and it had been folded, and still going to be worth something today, but nowhere near what the other one was. And I remember seeing those two, that disparity, and just thinking, man, that's just so, so you know, I've, if only that one that was damaged and it could be elevated to the status of the pristine, pure, unblemished one, but it's just not possible. You can't, you can't recreate on the earth. We can't just take things that are broken and, and ruined like that and just re, and restore it to how it was when it came off the printing press, right? You're going to see that sort of theme here in Malachi chapter 3, where the people are giving God their worst. They're, they're, they're presenting offerings to God that um, are not pleasing to him. And we'll see, though, it's not really about the gift. It's more about the giver. It's the heart of the giver behind the gift that God sees. Uh, and it's all connected in that way. So, um, Malachi chapter 3, if you have your Bible or on your phone, you can read along, or it'll be on the screen. See, I'm sending my messenger to prepare the way before me, and the Lord, Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. And the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming, and who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. He will sit as a refiner and purifier of silver, and he will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver, and they will bring offerings and righteousness to the Lord. Then the offering of Judah in Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord as in the days of old and as in former years. So last week we looked at a voice of hope, a voice of prophecy, the voice of Jeremiah. Jeremiah ministered in 6th century B.C. Jerusalem during a very difficult time, as we saw last week. It was a time of turmoil. The Babylonian Empire is descending upon Jerusalem, taking people into slavery, thousands of people, dead bodies all on the streets, uh, burning the temple, destroying the temple. Just a horrible, horrible time. And then in 5th century Malachi, you find a people that are post-exile, who have returned home, rebuilding, post-war, if you will, and they have slipped into a different type of enemy, the enemy of apathy and comfort, especially apathy toward temple worship and apathy toward following the law of Moses. And although the enemies without had departed, a new enemy within had presented itself, smugness and pride and greed and compromise. And so the Lord sends Malachi to redirect the people back on the path they should be on. In Malachi chapter 1, he, he rebukes the priests for not upholding the covenant, particularly the Levitical priests. Intermarriage among unbelievers at that time was rampant. Divorce rates were surging. He quotes that. Malachi charges them with, with violating the covenant of God, being permissive in every possible way, and corruption had just seeped into the worship of God. So much of Malachi, if you read the whole book, it is just full of strong rebuke and prophetic indictment. And all of it is deserved by, to, to, toward the people. In other words, it really fills you with that warm, fuzzy Christmas season with incandescent lighting and, 
and hot cider. And yet in all of that rebuke, Malachi gives a tendril of hope that grows up out of the ashes of what he is calling out. He says that this refiner will come one day. This is extraordinary. This is 500 years before Jesus is born. That this refiner will come to offer not just, show not just a problem, but a solution. That the people need to be, the priests need to be refined. And therefore, larger Jerusalem, Judah, the larger body of people need to be refined. So the Holy Spirit doesn't just give us, offers this, the, the problem to us. He always, always offers a solution as well. And he says, a refiner will come so that the people will worship God in righteousness, basically. For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. He will sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver and gold. Malachi uses language here of, that's kind of painful, really. It's stringent in the words he uses. You think of things like cauldrons of fiery metal, molten hot lava. Fuller's soap was like lye soap, strong soap intended to clean the dirtiest of garments. This, but this imagery, though, of fine clothing and gold and silver, it shows that to God, God's people are precious. That to God, God's people are of high value. That they're worth refining. Earlier in the book, the prophet says that this chastening will be directed toward the descendants of Levi. If you don't know what that means, the Levitical priests were the people that were basically the intermediaries between the people and God. They were the ones who offered the sacrifices on the altar to atone for the sins of the people. He, He condemns the priestly class straight up. And then he says, though, this purification, this refinement is going to go to the priests, but it's also going to extend out to the people. Now, why would God do this? He answers, he answers that question. So that the people will present offerings to the Lord, not just offerings, but offerings to the Lord in righteousness. In other words, this refiner is going to come, and he's going to refine the priesthood and the hearts of the people so that the people can worship God in righteousness, that someone will come one day who is perfect priest and sacrifice simultaneously. He will somehow send a, as he says, a servant or a messenger, a refiner to do this. Now in Malachi's day, they were, if you read the whole book, the, God is angry with them because they are offering sacrifices to God that are lame animals, old, sick, blind, the things that no one wants, right? The absolute last thing, they're giving God their worst. And God says, I am not not pleased by this. And some people, from a secular perspective, you'll read that and think, well, God's just mean. But that's not it. He sees the hearts of the giver behind, he doesn't care about the animal. He sees the heart of the people behind it. He sees that, it's, that, that they're, they're trying to deceive God. They're trying to, to have their own way. It's the heart of the people behind it. See, God doesn't desire a sacrifice necessarily. The perfect lamb. See, in Psalm 51, David reminds us, For you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You will not be pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. It's not the offering that makes them righteous. Their hearts needed to be transformed, the priests and the people. It's the person behind the offering that needs to be made righteous so that it's pleasing to the Lord. This is why this refiner will come, Malachi says. He will refine the people, not just the offering. So if you hear that, you may think, how in the world... Could a person come along one day and create this sort of transference to make thoroughly sinful people? I mean, Levitical priests would go through all sorts of purification in order to be clean, to go into the the Holy of Holies on Yom Kippur and offer sacrifices to God. But still, they're, they're still sinners, right? How in the world could a thoroughly sinful man or woman be refined? How in the world could God refine your life and my life like gold, silver, a garment. How could he do that? 
If you read the book of Hebrews, you'll see this theme throughout, that Jesus would be our perfect high priest and simultaneously the sacrifice. That he would be the intermediator to do that. He will not just come to ensure the right sacrifice is being made. He will be the sacrifice. Isaiah 53, a book of, a, a book of the Bible that was written at least 800 years before Jesus was born. Okay? But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. When you and I on Christmas Eve, we have candles and we have communion and it's great. And we remember the little baby Jesus. We cannot forget that the little baby Jesus and refiner Jesus, same Jesus. The one who would come as a little child would come to live and die for the sins of the world. Same guy, people like you and me. He would be crushed so that you might have peace. He went through the fire so that you would be refined. He took the wound so that you could be white as snow. Christ took the punishment on the cross that you and I deserved. We receive this good news. That's why it's called the gospel. That is good news, right? That's good news. That's good news. We receive this good news by faith, that God knows, even then in Malachi's day, he knew the people needed a new nature, a new heart, a transformed person inside and out, that no one's able to fulfill the law in its entirety. That was Paul's dilemma. He knew he couldn't do it, even though he was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He knew that his righteousness was like rags before God. That only by the grace of God are you and I seen as righteous in God's sight. No one can fulfill the law perfectly. So God says to Malachi, I'm going to send my servant, and he is going to fulfill all of this perfectly for the people so that they will be saved and be made clean. So yes, we receive that by faith. You pray a prayer to God and say, God, I receive this good news for myself by faith. It's called a prayer of confession or a prayer of salvation. If you've never done that, I highly recommend you do. But another way we receive this good news of refinement, of transformation, is is really by waiting, by patience, by faith, by trusting God. The word advent is Latin for adventus, which means to wait or waiting. Yes, we do wait for Christmas Eve. It's a time of preparation. But we submit to this great refiner by waiting, by being still. I was looking this week, how is silver or precious metal purified? And you see videos on Instagram all the time, all sorts of weird stuff. And um, my, my al- algorithm currently is, is cat videos and Christmas stuff, occasional basketball. Um, now I'm going to screw it all up because I looked up refining gold. But, you know, it's like a little, a little cauldron and this gets heated up and the, the, all the dross and the, the, the slag goes to the top and you scrape it off. And you do this over and over again so that it, it, obviously the impurities burn away and what's remained is just that pure, unblemished purity of beauty and strength and, 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 you know, things in this world are most valuable if they're pure and if they're unblemished, if they're highly refined and if they're rare, right? That's what connotes value. But what Malachi is getting at is that this Messiah is going to come. He's going to refine the people in the way that they most fundamentally need. He's not just speaking about people back then. He's speaking about all people, all time, I believe. He's going to give the people what they need more than they know what they need. They need their lives transformed. They need to be washed clean of their sin. They need to have a new nature and a new heart. Someone needs to come who will fulfill the law for them on their behalf, and that person is Jesus Christ, the only Son of God. So when I think about how things are refined, there's a TV show I used to watch. It's still, it was still on Discovery+. Plus. It's called How It's Made. Anybody ever watch this show? How It's Made? It's a great sleep aid if you don't, can't sleep at night. Really good. Um, it's just like a narrator talking while they make stuff. Sort of like the nurdle spring goes down the conveyor belt, and then they insert it into the blah, blah, blah. And it, you know, you're like, yes, keep going. And I'm like drooling while I'm like, eh. It's like watching Bob Ross paint or something. You know, it's like, it's so comforting 
when they're making belt sanders and crayons and candy and whatever, <laughs> tires and all kinds of stuff. Now, they have a couple of super riveting episodes about smelting. Highly recommend you check them out, okay? Screw up your algorithm, too. Now, I learned this, that obviously there's a heating process with refinement, but the cooling process is equally important. If you rush the cooling, you can create microscopic cracks in the metal, which can lead to structural failure if it's iron or steel. And with precious metals, it can cause damage to the metal. So it has to be cooled in a certain way. They put it in room temperature water, and then they leave it in room temperature air so that it gets to the perfect temperature uniform throughout. It's equally as important. And if it's not done, you can have disaster. You see the parallel I'm making that you and I go through cool-down periods in our lives, times of waiting, times you don't feel like waiting, times where faith is just a hurdle and you feel worn out and you're tired. But God knows, to the, the great refiner knows, that the times of waiting, the times of cool down, are actually times of strengthening, amen? There are times where God is strengthening you. I've, I just said it this morning, but I've said it many times. If you're in a period of your life where you have to trust God, like you have to trust him, that's a good time. That you're in the right spot, so I'm trying to say. I'm saying it's easy or good. I'm saying that you're in the right spot. If you have to trust God by faith, the Bible says the righteous will live by faith. In the times like that, the great refiner strives to build into our lives the qualities and ultimate use he has in mind for you. Waiting is an, escape, an inescapable part of the spiritual life. It's just the way it is. And it's, it's important because... God is every bit as interested in the process he takes you through as he is in the end result. To the great refiner, it really is about the journey, but also the destination. And Romans 8.28 reminds us, we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. I've prayed many times in my life over the years, God, make me patient. God, make me humble. Oh, be careful with that one. God, make me wise. Give me wisdom. God, help, help, me, help me grow in this way or that way. And, and those are great prayers, and God answers those prayers. But you have to be ready, though, for what the answer to those prayers might entail. Because if you say to God, God, make me patient, he could very well put you in, in situations where you have to practice patience. Are you ready to do that? Jesus, give me more glory and, and, and authority. and be, Okay. Be careful for what you might get on the other end of that prayer. In Mark chapter 10, James and John, sons of Zebedee, two of the apostles, they go to Jesus, and Matthew 20, their mom comes along. So mama comes along in one part, other version of the story. All three of them come to Jesus and say, Jesus, we want to ask you something. And he graciously says, what do you want? And they say, we want you to do whatever we ask you to do. And he again graciously says, what do you want to ask me to do? And they say, when you come into your kingdom, we want to be at your right hand and your left hand. We want to be in the places of authority. Jesus says, you don't know what you're asking. Are you able to drink the cup of suffering I'm about to drink? You will actually drink the cup of suffering, and they eventually would. So it's one thing to say, God, refine me, make me new, and he will. We're talking about sanctification here in many ways. But when, when Romans 8.28 says, God, for the, those who love God, all things work together for good, it's one thing to ask for. It's another thing to be patient in the cool down, to be patient in the waiting, to trust God when nothing else makes sense. But here's the good news, friends, is that the Holy Spirit is here as our friend and our guide and our comforter and our advocate. He's present with us in our times of trouble, that God helps us. He helps us pray what we don't know how to pray. He helps the words of the Bible come alive in your life. He's present with you in those times of waiting, and he strengthens us in those moments. So what I'm not saying is we, were just, we should just rejoice in the midst of suffering. 
we should just be happy in a weird, culty kind of way, like in times of pain. The Bible doesn't say that. Romans 5 reminds us that we rejoice in the midst of suffering, knowing that suffering produces endurance. Endurance produces character, and character produces hope. So Paul's not just saying, hey, we rejoice in suffering, period. He says, no, we, we do that. We rejoice in the waiting and the trials of life because it, God has produced some, something within us. There's an end result in mind. He's the great refiner, friends. He's the, 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 he's the potter's hand. He's seeking to produce holiness in your life. He says here, we rejoice in the midst of our suffering, knowing that suffering produces endurance, Endurance produces character. Character in Romans 5, that's, a, that's, the, that's the blockbuster word. Doikimas. D-O-K-I-M-A-S. It literally means someone or something that's been put to the test and is measured up. That's what it means. So that when we wait on God and we pr- he produces endurance within us, he strengthens us in our waiting, and that from that waiting, he, he, he sees that okay, by his strength in you, it's got all grace, But by God working in us, he says, you have endured it to the end. I have helped you. I've been with you every step of the way. If you've ever traveled to the Middle East and you've gone into a souvenir shop, they have pottery all over the place, and they've got cups and bowls and all sorts of vessels and things that have been handcrafted, and uh, many of them make their livelihood, of course, that way. And if you turn those over, you'll see, of course, it's a vessel that has been through the furnace, but it hasn't cracked. It's came out. It's beautiful. It's for sale. It, it's flawless in a way. If you turn it over, the ones that are for sale are stamped with a word. Doikimus. It means approved. It's a vessel of character. It's saying this vessel has withstood the furnace. It has been refined, but it has not broken. It is whole, it's complete. Through Christ, you and I can trust him as Savior, and when God looks at you, he doesn't see your sin, he sees his son. It's called imputed righteousness. So that when God looks at you, he sees approved. He sees character, endurance, hope, joy, peace. I have bestowed all of this upon you. I have stamped my love upon your heart. So who's done that work? Not you. Certainly not me. Not the work of the impure metal or the broken clay. Not the one who feels like you're not good enough or you're cast off or you're far from God or or you're broken, you're not pure enough. Hey, if you don't feel like you're not pure enough, you're in great company. Join the club. We're all in that boat together as sinners, as people. It's the potter, it's the great refiner, it's the skilled craftsman. That you and I can emerge as approved, doikimus, refined and tested, not because of what we have done, but because the refiner has stood in the gap for me and for you. That he purifies, Christ cleanses. Why would God prophesy this in Malachi chapter 3? Malachi in verse 1, verse 2, chapter 1, verse 2, very beginning of Malachi, God says this to to the priest in Judah, he says, I have loved you, says the Lord. Malachi 1 verse 2, I have loved you, but I have this charge against you. People that go, the Old Testament God is so mean and nasty. He's, he's not. It's God. It's all God, okay? The whole Bible is God. He's saying, I have loved you, but you have strayed away. It's like, it's like Revelation, like the church of Laodicea. You've forgotten your first love. Return to me. He says, I have loved you. This is why the Lord wants to purify and refine our lives again and again. Notice in Malachi, it doesn't say this refiner is like a forest fire or an incinerator that just burns indiscriminately and takes everything out and leaves nothing behind. God's not like that. No. Many people can be afraid of God because you think God is like a forest fire or an incinerator. And he's just going to judge you and condemn you and accuse you of all the things that you've done wrong in your life. And he'll just burn everything up of who you are and there'll be nothing left of you. But what if the alternative is actually true? 
What if this great refiner will burn off everything that's not of him and leave the best sort of you left behind? The best sort of you that was intended in the Garden of Eden. See, that's not what God is like. Malachi 3, 6 tells us, I, the Lord, do not change. So you, O descendants of Jacob, are not destroyed. God does not want to destroy his people. A refiner's fire is slow and patient and controlled and focused. Realizing the process of transformation he wants to take our lives through. You can't rush a refiner's fire. This love of God is slow and patient with you. He's kind to you in your waywardness. Now, it got me thinking again. How in the world are those two baseball cards? Mickey Mantle, probably worth a lot more than you'd think today. $12.7 million. There's a lot of gap there. How in the world could this damaged thing be, ever be elevated to purity and perfection and value? Well, in the eyes of the world, it's impossible. But see, with God, all things are possible, amen? Amen. He can, he can do the impossible in your life. You might think you've done things that are unforgivable. Nope. God will forgive it. He already has forgiven it, actually. This is what we're talking about with refinement. And not just to believe it in your head and go, that sounds great, yeah, okay, Merry Christmas. But to believe it in your heart. The 18 inches from here to here, that's the longest journey you'll ever take. It's the hardest one to ro- road to walk. But God knows we need it. God sees your heart. He already knows what you need more than you know what what you need, and you need a great refiner in your life. You need one that you receive that cleansing yet again because God is good and God is love. Let's pray. God, once again, yet again, day after day, we submit ourselves to your refining love. Thank you for the ways that you see the end product in mind, but you also value the process of shaping and molding us into the people you've called us to be. Thank you, God, that you know that our broken pieces do not define us, that the ways we have failed, you will pick those pieces up, combine them, and create something beautiful in our hearts and our lives and our souls. Just as you prophesied through Malachi so long ago, you're doing that work today, now, in the lives of your people. And God, the good news is that we get to receive that for ourselves yet again today by faith. Continue to refine and sanctify us, Holy Spirit. I pray for anyone today that has a great deal of burden on their heart, on their mind. They feel they can't overcome. And they're crushed by the chains of which they carry. I pray for freedom, Jesus. I pray for redemption. I pray they would know, God, of your refining, transforming, controlled burn in our lives. God, you do this for us because you love us so much, more than we can even fathom. So we thank you for this time together and welcome your work, you the potter's hand. Shape and mold us, God, to who you've called us to be, Jesus. In your name we pray, amen.
guest with us. We're so glad to have you with us. And if you did not pick up a devotional yet, these are for free in the back. Our beautiful devotions written from each day are in Advent by our church staff, so please grab one of these. And then next Sunday night, we're having our Christmas drive through at 5 p.m. outside all around the campus. Hundreds of cars will drive through. Please come, uh, but also if you're willing to volunteer, please let me know. We need a lot of people to pull this off. Um, so it's not quite the same if, uh, if Mary and Joseph don't show up. So... <laughs> Uh, uh, you just have to literally stand there, okay? Just dress warm. Um, but just let me know if you'd like to help. Uh, it would be a great experience let, next Sunday evening. Again, take an announcement sheet. A lot of great things going on. Uh, the Children's Nativity is just in a few minutes at 11 in the sanctuary. So that's where I'll be headed in just a moment. Uh, please go check that out if you can. It's a great tradition. I think there's like 72 children uh, participating this year. Um, so yay, Wesley Memorial Kids. <laughs> uh, wow. Um, yes. So, friends, you leave this place and you go into the world um, to do ministry. Know that the great refiner will continue to refine and sanctify and grow you if you'll submit to his hand. That he loves us enough not to leave us as we are, but to lead us where we should be and can be with his grace in our lives. So in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, go in peace. Amen.